Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today at our Easter Sunday service. My name is Jermaine. And I'm Claudia. And we know that on a day like today, it's not the norm for you to be at home. So we're glad that you joined us. And today as we worship and hear the word, we pray that you'll be blessed. But just before that, we have a box pop. So we went out on the streets and we asked persons, what does Easter mean to you? Let's listen in to what they had to say. Here we go. Easter weekend. It is Saturday and I'm out in the streets. I'm keeping myself distant from people. Um, you'll hear the cars passing and all of that. So today, what I'm going to do is a box pop. So I'm just going to go around, ask a few questions. I have one question in particular, being that it's Easter. And that one question will be, what does Easter mean to you? And uh, we just want to get from you, what Easter means to you? <laughs> all that's been going on. What does Easter mean to you and why? For me, when I think about the cross and uh, Jesus Christ and what he has done for me and uh, the whole world, you know, he gave his life for us. That's right. And I am redeemed. We are redeemed. It makes her very happy. Yes, we are redeemed. <laughs> If it wasn't for his redemption, trust me when I tell you, I would not be standing here before you. Okay. Okay. This season causes me to reflect on my life, on what God has done. What does Easter mean to you? Well, I think that for me, Easter is a time of reflection. Um, to reflect on the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made on my behalf. Because I really believe that Easter is about us. Because the scripture tells us that it was for us that he died. It was only for our transgression. Most of our iniquities just to make a more Easter than one end. So that it's about, Easter is about us. The next thing for, each for me, Easter is a time of celebration. I know we, we, we tend to eat a lot of bun and cheese. Yes, we do. But Easter is more than bun and cheese. It's the time when we celebrate the life and person and work of Jesus Christ as well as resurrection. Because without the resurrection, there is no hope. Oh. oh, Jesus. He died for us. We crucified him. And we never had a sin. He died to save us and all the things that we did for the family. When you hear Easter, what do you think about? Easter. When I hear about Easter, I think about Jesus died for our sins and rose on the third day. And he rose on the third day. So when you think about it, like knowing that somebody died for you, like give up them life for you. You, how does that make you feel? Happy. Happy? Yes. It makes you feel happy to know that someone died for you, right? Yes. Any other emotion? Enjoy. Enjoy. Oh, so you feel happy and you just feel wonderful about the whole thing. Yes. Okay. So what are you going to do with the rest of the time that you're home? I'm going to play and eat cheese. Okay. What do you think? What do you mean to you? Alright, for me, um, it represents the time that Jesus actually came to earth and died yeah. for our sins. Yeah. Right? But then he raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. um, so, that is what we celebrate Easter for, or that's what I celebrate Easter for. I don't think we appreciate it as much as we should, you know, because. We don't sit down and meditate and say, oh, imagine somebody dying, just dying for you. Their purpose was to die for you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really a big, mm -hmm. it's yeah. a big, big thing to me. So that's the end of it, guys. That is the end. We went around, as you saw, and we just wanted to know from the people, what do you 
what does Easter mean to them? And they told us. Um, for different people, it meant different things. Um, what a better place to do my last recording than at a place where I can get all of these mangoes. So all of this is mine. I'm not sure it's you guys. I don't know. But until next time, later guys. Welcome family, it's Resurrection Sunday and we serve the resurrected King. Hallelujah, celebrate Jesus, celebrate. He is risen forevermore.
Hallelujah. who could take our place our sacrifice the perfect one the holy lamb of god he alone is worthy join with us and sing he alone is worthy to worship and adore Hallelujah. Yes, 
Welcome again, family. It is good to be with you again another day, giving thanks to the Lord for the opportunity to again be in the land of the living and to share from God's word to you. Let us just say a word to the Lord. And so, Lord God Almighty, again we come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. At this time, mighty God, we are thankful that he is not dead. We serve a risen king. So, Lord God, as we go through our talk this morning, I pray, Lord God, that you will speak through me. Lord God, may lives be changed, mighty God, through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it is good that we are still keeping up with all that is happening. In recent times, the news, we have had so many persons becoming reporters. If you check online these days, there's so many persons giving the news. And one wonders which news item is real and which news item is, is false. You know, I mean, several WhatsApp groups and persons just keep forwarding and forwarding so many messages. I wonder, is this really true? Should I, how do, how do I believe this? You know, where's the evidence supporting this? There was one the other day with lions. They sent me a picture of a lion in Russia, said Putin let out some lions. And I'm like, uh, where did them get these things from? Recently, the, the Prime Minister, when he gave an update to the nation, spoke to the guy that was arrested, um, one in Westmoreland. And I think from that time it has slowed down and occurred. Persons realize now that you can be arrested. They can actually track to see who started sending the fake news. Right? Well, fake news has been around a long time. It's not just today persons have been sending fake news. In fact, when we look to the scripture today, we'll see that from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there has been a report, and we look at both reports this morning. The report given by the soldiers and those given by the women who went to the tomb. Because both reports will change how we view Jesus this morning. Ripley's other thing years ago, Ripley's believe it or not. And some other time I would question some of these things. I'm wondering if it is, if it's true. Sometimes it sounds too good to be true. So our talk today is focused on believe it or not. Believe it or not. I will be focusing on the resurrection. So we'll be examining two reports. Two reports about the empty tomb. And we pick up in Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28, and we will read from verse 1 through to verse 10, looking at the reports. And as we examine the reports, we will see the implications of 
believe in the report. If you believe the soldiers' report, what happens when you believe it? And if we believe the report of the women, what happens when you believe it? And we'll also look at evidence supporting the women, other evidence from scripture supporting the women. So I want to pick up the story in Matthew 28 there. It is resurrection morning. But in the previous chapter, what we, we noticed, the chief priests, yes, and the Pharisees, they went to Pilate. And they said to Pilate, Jesus said he would raise on the third day. And if he is in fact risen on the third day, then the first, as it says there, then the, the last deception will be worse than the first. So Pilate actually gave them soldiers, and the soldiers went to the tomb to guard the tomb. So let us read what happened there in Matthew 28, 1 to 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake because the angel of the Lord descending from heaven approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his robe was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken from fear of him that they became like dead men. So the women are there seeing what is, what is happening and the guards are also there seeing what is happening. Verse five of chapter 28. But the angel told the women, don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here for he has been resurrected. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Verse seven, then go quickly and tell the disciples he has been raised from the dead. In fact, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I've told you so. Let's pick it up there. In verse 8, so departing quickly from the tomb, with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. But just then, Jesus met them and said, good morning. They came up, took off their, they came up, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus told them, don't be afraid, go and tell my brothers to leave from Galilee and they will see me there. So there we have two set of witnesses, the soldiers and the women. Let us look closely at the soldiers report. So when we go further down in Matthew, same 28, 11, the soldiers, they go back to the chief priests. It says there in verse 11, as they were on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders and agreed on a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money and told them, say this, his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. If this reaches the governor's ear, we will deal with him and keep you out of trouble. Verse 15 and final. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been spread among Jewish people to this day. Believe it or not. Believe it or not. And verse 13, we'll zoom in there on their report. His disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. If we believe this report, it has a number of implications for us. Let us look at those. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, as these soldiers reported, and many other Jews believe it, what would have happened? I'll turn our attention to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13 to 19. Now there, the Apostle Paul is also speaking to the Corinthian church, and he's also saying, if, if Christ isn't resurrected, these things would also happen. And it says there, in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 15, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, and then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is without foundation, and so is your faith. 
So Christianity has no foundation. The foundation of Christianity says that God Almighty sent his one and only son here to die on the cross for our sins. We believe that he, was, he rose again and he's gone to heaven to prepare a place. So if that important aspect of the resurrection is not there, then we have no foundation. And just like a house, if you remove the foundation, everything else will come crashing down. So if the foundation is missing, the resurrection, and everything starts crumbling, what's the next thing that's going to crumble? It says there, our preaching is in vain. Preaching is in vain. Which means then, the churches are closed now because of the whole corona virus. They can't remain closed because what is happening? We have been preaching in vain because Jesus is dead. Jesus is dead. If we believe the report of the gods, Jesus is dead and we have been wasting our time. The church has been wasting time over thousands of years preaching about Jesus when in fact he is dead. So our preaching is in vain. Just another religion. Just another man. Even worse, our faith is in, in vain. So the foundation is, has crumbled. Our preaching has crumbled. And also our faith. So you can stop praying to Jesus because he is not hearing. He wouldn't be hearing because he would be preaching to a dead man. If you believe the report of the soldiers that they actually stole the body, then you're preaching to a dead body, right? We are witnessing and going to people, telling them about a man that is dead. So our preaching is in vain. Our faith is in vain. But also there in verse 15, Paul says as well, in addition, we are, uh, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified about God that he has been raised, whom he said, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. So that basically is saying we are false witness, telling lie. If Jesus Christ is not raised and the report of the soldiers is true, we are false witness. And we need to stop. It says to us, we are false witness. Right? And so when we go house to house and we're telling people about Jesus, that he died for us, we're telling lie. The songs we're singing, we're lying. And we would need to stop it. Stop it now. If this report is true, all that we are doing, we need to stop. But it goes on to say, give us even a grimmer picture. A grimmer picture there in verse 17. If Christ has not been, not been raised from the dead, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Which means we are still sinners. If Christ is not raised from the dead, we are still sinners. Which means, as the scripture says, the wages of sin is death, and we are in fact hell bound. Our destination is hell. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, the Christian Christianity has no foundation. We can stop preaching. We can keep the churches closed. We can stop going out to witness because we would be considered liars. We can stop praying because we are praying to a dead man. And we have no forgiveness for our sin. But it goes on to give even a grimmer picture. Therefore, since we, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished, if we have placed our hope in Christ for this only, we should be pitied more than anyone else. No future. I've been to a lot of, of funerals in, in my short time. I have a lot of funeral programs at home. My sister keeps telling me to throw them away. But one of the things, I've never been to a funeral that they have said the person is on his way to hell. Everybody's gone to a better place in paradise, in heaven there. And if it is that Christ has not been raised from the dead, according to the report, we have no future and nobody will be going to heaven. Nobody will be going to heaven. No forgiveness for your sins and the destination there 
is hell. What a tragedy. What a tragedy if that report is true. But let's look at the woman's report. Let's look at the report given by the woman. Now, the report, the details of the report can be found in Luke's Gospel, Luke 22, Luke 24, reading from verse 22 to 24. And as the disciples, those who were, were on the Emmaus road, they encountered, they encountered Jesus. And they said to him there, Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb. And when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was indeed alive. So the report from the women say that Jesus is alive. Believe it or not. If it is, Christ has been raised from the dead according to these, the report of the woman, then it stands well for the church. It stands well for Christianity. Our firm foundation then is firm. The foundation of our faith tells us that God Almighty sent his one and only son, born of a virgin. He came, he grew up, and he died for our sins. You see, the, 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 at Christmas we celebrate his birth. But his birth isn't so important as his death. It is his death that saved us. So our foundation of our faith is firm if Christ has been raised from the dead. And our faith is genuine. I said before, when I spoke about the soldiers, if, if Christ hadn't been raised from the dead, then our faith, we are false witnesses telling lies, so we should stop, right? We should stop preaching. But if it is Christ has been raised from the dead, then our faith is genuine. We can go and we can witness and we can tell people that indeed Jesus Christ came. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. He has gone to prepare a better place. And we, have the con we, are, we are convinced of this. Our witness is genuine. Our faith is genuine. We can know that when we pray, we are not praying to a dead man. We know he's a God who hears our prayer. And we can continue praying. We can continue singing, knowing that Jesus Christ is alive. So when we speak, we know that we are not liars. So if we, report, if we believe the report of the woman that Jesus is in fact alive, we, our faith is genuine. Our forgiveness is accomplished. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Forgiveness. He has forgiven our past sins, our present sin, and our future sins. It is finished. And our future is secure. So we don't have to worry about our destination. Our destination as people of God, if we have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, our destination, our final destination is heaven. Is heaven. We don't have to be fearful about when we die, right? 120 years time from now, if God doesn't come back to his earth, for his earth, we'll all be dead. But we don't have to fear because our future is secure. Whose report will you believe? So I gave you the report there of the soldiers, and I also gave you the report of the women. Both showing implications, if you believe what the soldiers said, we have no foundation for our faith. Whatever we are preaching is in vain. Our faith is in vain, we are false witness, we have no forgiveness of sins, and we have no future. But if you believe the report of the woman that Christ has been risen from the dead, our foundation is firm, our faith is genuine, our forgiveness is accomplished, and our future is secure. But let us just provide some evidence. Let us provide some supporting evidence from supporting the woman's report on Jesus. Now, the first supporting evidence of this, we can see there in Luke 24, 13 to 35. It wasn't just the women that Jesus appeared to, 
but he also appeared to other disciples. And we see there the encounter of Emmaus, the Emmaus disciples as they walked and they sat with him. They realized that it was Jesus. And they, in fact, ran to the other disciples to tell them that, hey, we have encountered Jesus. And what the woman said is true. It is true that Jesus is raised. Right? So Jesus appeared to them also. In John 20, 19 to 29, we see where he appeared to the, his disciples. He appeared to them. And Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas said he would have to actually touch him. Touch the wounds and see those the marks in his hand to actually believe. And when he came, when he appeared to him, he was able to, to touch him and see the marks. And it is true that we will also see the marks when we go to heaven. We will, when we see Jesus, we will see the nails in his hand. And we give thanks for that. And also, there is evidence that he appeared also to Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, Zebedee, and the other disciples while they were fishing. While they were fishing, he appeared to them. So there's witness of others. Witness of others. There's also the evidence their support in terms of the change of lifestyle of those who came in contact with Jesus. When we look to, in Acts there, we see Peter, Acts chapter 2, verse 40 to 40. A few weeks before, this was the same Peter who denied Jesus three times. You knew him, you were with him. No, I wasn't with him. He denied him. He said, yes, certainly. He said, no, the third time, Jamaica would say, because some words there to them in decent language. Right, telling them to confirm and they left him alone there. But here in verse 32 of Acts chapter 2, it says, Peter is speaking to the crowd, God has res resurrected this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received him from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. Peter is telling them there that he also a sign. And we see now the boldness in Peter as he now approaches life. Not fearful as before, but now faithful, faithfully serving God. There is also supporting evidence from Paul. We see Paul there as he persecuted the church when he had his encounter with Jesus. Scripture says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In Acts chapter 9, and it says there in verse 5, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you, are, whom you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will told what you must do. And when you come to, to Philippians, we no longer see a, a persecutor, but a preacher to the church. Evidence there supported that Jesus is in fact resurrected in the lives of Peter and Paul. And also, if we look into our lives, we can see the change. If you have given your life to Jesus, you, there is evidence in your life of the change. In my life, even now, many times I sit down and wonder, how did I get here? How did I get here? And the scripture says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. It is now 2010, and I remember I got baptized in the assembly, December 31st, 2005, right? And I can say from that day, 2005, I have never smoked again. I have never smoked again, right? Before, I used to stop, stop, and then I start back. And I can see the change in my life as a result of my encounter with Christ. Years ago, you would never see some, I never even saw myself preaching. A dedicated wrestler man, dedicated from high school, you know, had my Maccabee Bible, reading, love Africa, and so on, dedicated to him. What a change Christ has brought into my life. Evidence of his resurrection there. Just like Peter, just like Paul, there is evidence in the change of lifestyle that I have found. So we have the supported evidence of the witnesses. And evidence is key. When you go to the court to prove anything, you have to have witness supporting it. And we had the witness of others there who saw him. Not just Mary and the others, but we also saw the disciples over time there 
telling others that they in fact saw Jesus. We saw the witness. There is evidence of being a witness of the change of the lifestyle of those who came in contact with him. We have Peter as an example, we have Paul, and we have so many others when they came in contact with Jesus, their life has been changed. And also there is a witness in the fulfillment of the scripture. Scripture speaks to many prophecies that will take another service to look at all the prophecies showing that Jesus was to come. He proved himself that he indeed is the son of God and he was raised from the dead and he has gone to prepare a place. There's a lot of scripture speaks to this. A lot of scripture that speaks to this. So there is a supporting evidence of the disciples, the change in their lifestyle and also the scriptures. Believe it or not. Believe it or not. Jesus has been risen. Jesus is risen. We do not serve a God that is dead this morning, but we serve a risen Savior. And this time is a very difficult time, you know, for the world. Death. There is a fear of sickness and death all around us, right? But we can rejoice. Because the scripture tells us that Jesus, because of his resurrection, has given us victory. He has received victory over death. First Corinthians 15, 55 to 57 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this Easter, we can rejoice because Jesus had, has paid it all. He has, received, he has given us victory over death. And we go to Revelation. It's even harder to understand. You see death being tossed. Death and head is being thrown in the lake of fire. You're like, how do that will happen? But scripture tells us that that will be fulfilled there in scripture. So for the Christian this morning, you can rejoice in the resurrection of the Lord. But if you have not given your life this morning... It says there, believe or not. Believe or not. If you believe that Jesus Christ indeed came, died on the cross, and he rose again, you need to move from believing this morning to take an act of faith, to accept him as Lord in your life. The scripture declares to us in Romans 10 verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Will you accept him this morning before it's too late? Indeed. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. And so, Lord God, we thank you again for your word. We rejoice this morning knowing that our foundation is firm. Our foundation stands on the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our faith is secure. Our sins have been forgiven, and our future is secure. We say thanks this morning for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lead us now once more in Jesus' name as we say thanks. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today, family. And you know, as I reflect on the word that Tina just shared, I'm reminded that because Christ is risen indeed, my forgiveness is accomplished. And that is an amazing reality. And we would love for that reality to be the same for you. So if you've never given your life to Christ, we would love for you to consider doing that today. And remember, we're here to serve you. We're here to pray with you. Thanks again for joining us. Have a wonderful week and see you on Wednesday.